Yeah, it's amazing that you hit a unicorn like that right out of the gates. I mean, with a mailer that was so little, you got the, just the, the perfect seller. I mean, that situation's amazing. And then make a hundred thousand dollar rip on your third deal. Those don't come along every day. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Best Deal Ever Show. I'm your lovable host, Ken Corsini, who, with my wife Anita, have flipped over 800 houses in Atlanta since 2005 and even have a show on HGTV. But this show isn't about us, it's about all the amazing real estate investors out there that are crushing it. It's about their stories, their best deals how they sourced them, how they funded them, and what we can learn from their experiences. This is the Best Deal Ever Show. Hey, Bigger Pockets community, before we jump into this video, I want you to take two seconds and go to biggerpockets.com forward slash best deals to reserve your copy of my new book, Profit Like the Pros. Between the bonuses we're giving away and the content in the book, I promise you will not be disappointed. Again, biggerpockets.com forward slash best deals. Hey, this is Ken Corsini with the Best Deal Ever Show. Today, I am joined by my new friends, Crystal and Dedrick Polite. How are you guys doing? Hi, doing great. doing great. Thanks for having us. No, thrilled to have you guys on. Now, you guys are out of the North Carolina market. Tell folks where you guys live. Yes, we are from Burlington, North Carolina, which is right outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. Right. In okay. Yeah, so that's just south of, uh, of Raleigh? Yep, in between Raleigh, Durham, and Winston-Salem. Okay. And nor north of Charlotte, too, I guess. Yes, yeah. north of Charlotte. That's a good little, man, that's a great little triangle up there, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome area. Um, one of the best places to live in America. You got people moving from all over the country. Yeah. We're here, yeah. Well, and, uh, and I would imagine probably not overly competitive either. I mean, I'm sure Charlotte's competitive and Raleigh's competitive, but you're sort of in, the, in between. Yeah, right. we found a nice little sweet spot in between. And we do deals in Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, Wilmington, all over North Carolina. You do? Okay. All right. So you guys do some traveling up there. Yes. A lot of our stuff's virtual, actually. Yes. So our yeah. actual market um, for North Carolina, where we really go hard, is between Raleigh and Charlotte. So all the way through. Oh, interesting. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, how long have you guys been at this? So um, I actually bought my first investment property in 2007. Uh, then I went back to work in the corporate America. That was a triplex that I bought. House hacked it. This nice. is before we got married. Uh, then we got together. We both had corporate jobs, but really 2017 is when we sold our franchise and we went um, full steam ahead into real estate investing. So what kind of franchise did you guys have? What business were you in? It was a, um, a mall. It was, it's called Animal Ride. So if you ever went to the mall and you saw these little scooters that look like little animals that kids were, and adults were riding on. Okay. That's the franchise that we bought into. So we had three locations, uh, Charlotte, one here in Greensboro, another one in New Hampshire um, as well. Interesting. And so you guys sold the franchise and were like, we're going real estate. Yep. Yes. He had been talking about it forever in a day. So yeah, I said, always want to be a real estate investor. I just, you know, I'm the analytical type. So I was in the whole analysis paralysis mode until right. I met this young lady and she is like serial entrepreneur, balls to the wall. So she... Pushed, pushed us out the door like, hey, stop talking about flipping yes. houses and let's actually start getting educated and doing it. Yep. Wow. That's, you know, it's funny. It's usually the other way around, I feel like, in like husband-wife relationships. It's like the husband's like got this all this vision and, and the wife's more conservative and he's going to kind of convince her that this is a good thing to do. And in your case, it was the other way around. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so cool. So how many deals have you guys done then over the last uh, three, four years? Buy and hold or just fix and Everything. Play? Everything probably about. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, oh my god! Right now we have twenty three buy and hold um, units that we own. Oh, nice! You know, probably like fifty wholesale deals. Yep. 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 Good for you guys too. I know we talked about this just a second. I mean, it's buy and hold is where it's at. I mean, the, I, when you're in the business, it is a business, and so you sort of get caught up with flipping and wholesaling, and it's you know you can make a, a pretty decent rip here, but it's sometimes it's hard to be disciplined to just keep those cherries and just wait and build that wealth. And so kudos to you guys for, for being smart and disciplined to do that. Yeah. Yes. Our, our whole thing when we got into this, Ken, was we only started wholesaling to buy and hold. So that's our oh, main wow. strategy. When we got started, we both had corporate jobs. We're making good money, but we didn't have a ton of savings to start flipping houses. Well, we always wanted passive income. So we found out about wholesaling and we're like, hey, let's wholesale some houses and get some capital and start buying more rental properties. And that's literally what we've been able to do over the past three years is replace our income, 
from corporate America. We're making comfortably over, you know, several six figures. And now we're both full-time real estate investors and entrepreneurs. Smart, man. And that really is what you should run your business like. It's basically pay the bills, give yourself a salary, and then just crank the rest of it, man, into, into long-term buy and holds. Absolutely. That's amazing. So just curious, how do you guys, your, your, so your model, what are your, how are you finding deals and then how are you deciding what to do with them right now? So um, direct-to-seller marketing, um, I handle the sales, acquisition, finance, business <laughs> development. My wife handles marketing. She is like the marketing ninja. She knows how to go direct-to-seller and you know, whether it's text messaging, cold calling, direct mail, she's mastered marketing nice. because she looks at it like a puzzle. So yep. it's a perfect combination. She tees up the leads and motivated sellers. I, I talk to them, get the properties on the contract, and then we either keep them as rentals or we flip them to another investor. Killer. Winning combination, guys. That's fantastic. All right, so let's pivot. So you've been at this for a handful of years. I'm sure that there is one deal in particular that stands out as your best deal ever. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, our best deal ever was, what day was it? Um, it was a virtual wholesale deal out of Boston. So of course okay. live in North Carolina. Um, and what took place with that deal was I had um, filtered out a really, really um, small niche list um, of properties in Boston. And I had uploaded them into um, our app um, called Deal Machine, which is a driving for dollars app that we use. Mm -hmm. Uploaded them into Deal Machine, and the list was about 69 people. Uploaded into Deal Machine, sent out mailers, and the wife called us back. Um, and it, I was really still really new to this. We hadn't even, this was in uh, May, June 2018. So we were still chasing our first deal. Okay. We hadn't closed our first wholesale deal yet. And again, my wife took over marketing. She had just left her job yeah, June, June 8th, 2018. So she's doing the marketing, trying to figure it out. I'm still doing a full-time job in the day. And then in the evenings, I'm going out on appointments and you know, meeting with sellers and stuff. So right. we were still trying to figure it out. And yeah. she, again, she targeted this very niche motivated seller list. And we got a bunch of callbacks from it. And one of them ended up being this, this huge deal. Yep, it was the wife who called back uh, July 11th, actually, uh, 2018. She called back and said, hey, I got your postcard. And we would be interested in selling the property. I said, great. Where is the property? Um, where is the property at? She gave me the address and the information. She was like, but let me have my husband call you back. And I said, okay, great. Um, what's his name? Got his name. <clears throat> she was like, I'll call you back. I'll have him call you back. And you guys can take it from there. <clears throat> so I said, perfect. And I sent the information to Dedrick. Dedrick was on the call. He got off. He was like, wait, where'd you get this information? I was like, oh, a lead just came in through, from the deal machine. He's like, do you know where this property is? I was like, uh, no, just Dorchester. I, I looked it up and I said, I was like, I think we just hit the mother load because where this property is, I don't know what this neighborhood is in Atlanta, but it's in like that gold or that red zone. Really? People are in houses like hotcakes in this area. So yes. when I saw it, I was like, man, this is like the perfect. Jackpot. Yeah. yeah. Well, so what, so I guess you were, you're originally from Boston. Is that sort of was what the motivation was for marketing up there? Absolutely. Yeah. That is our backyard because we both grew up there our entire life. Went to college there. Um, okay. So when people was like, oh, you know, start with your backyard. I told people like we are Boston in our backyard. We can flip the property there without ever having to step foot in the city. Gotcha. Okay. I'm curious then what this list was. This, I mean, 69 is a really small list to even so, get one callback. So I'm curious what niche right. list this was. Right. And we got from that one list, we got 17 callbacks. Come um, on. Holy yeah. cow. So um, it was an absentee out of state. So an out of state absentee landlord purchased prior to 85. Okay. Um, owned free and clear. Yep, no mortgage. Um, what else was it? Owned free and clear. I think that and, was it. Those were the filters, yeah. Yep, I think those were. So the, the, the seller actually. We, he ended up living in New Jersey. Oh, in the county. So it was Suffolk County. Which is Boston. Which is Gotcha. Boston, gotcha. Jersey. So the seller lived in Jersey. He had inherited this house in the 80s, mid-80s, when his uncle died and he got the house. And I looked him up and he was a successful, you know, executive living in Jersey, owned a million dollar townhouse. So he just had this house in Boston. He didn't even know who was in it. I was like, are you getting rent for this house? He's like, I don't know. I think there's some people there, but I don't even pay attention to it. 
They ended up being squatters in the property. It was a ton of hair on the deal. Sure. But it was just one of those jackpots where he didn't even know what was going on in that neighborhood with the property. Wow. So, yeah. Which is why I picked that why list. Why she targeted that list. So I said to yeah. him, and I just taken over marketing, literally, I just taken it over. And I said to myself, what would make me sell if I was in that market? Mm -hmm. And I chose out of state owners because in a city like Boston, if you live anywhere in the vicinity, you know what's going on. Any city. If it's Atlanta, you look and look around a neighborhood and see and houses see. getting flipped left and right. right. But yeah. if you are out of state, you have no idea what's going on. And right. for him, he had no idea that his property was now worth one point five million. ARV was. ARV. Yeah. So, which is why we got so many callbacks from that out-of-state owner is because none of them knew what was going on. These were just inherited properties. Smart, smart. Yep. No, we, it's funny. We hit the same. We don't hit quite as targeted, but out-of-state absentee <laughs> all day long. I love that list. We're the, the same way. So, okay. So, you get him on the phone. And, and so, what does, he, what does he say? He's willing to sell. Does he even have a price in mind? Yeah, so I get him on the phone. I'm, I'm building a rapport, you know, trying to connect with him. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'd be willing to sell. I'm like, okay, well, how much do you want for it, of course? And he's like, I don't even, I don't have any idea. So I'm like, okay. And he's like, you know what? If you gave me 500000 I would be happy with that, 500000 And I'm already knowing in my head, like, the ARV is $1.5 million. Right. But of course, you know, I'm, I got to play hardball. Right. So I'm like, oh uh, well, you know, I, I need to see the property. So when can I, when can me and my partner do a walkthrough? And he's like, well, you can't see it because I don't have a key. Um, there's people living in there. I'm like, okay, well, who's the tenants? So, you know, can we coordinate something? He's like, I don't even know who's in there. I'm like, okay, are you collecting rent? Every once in a while, they'll send me a check, but I don't really pay it. So it's all this. I'm like, okay, you want me to pay a half a million sight unseen, but in the back of my mind, I still know. Okay. So I was like, all right, what about 375? And he was like, no, I can't do that. So then we started the negotiation of going back and forth, right? Um, so that's kind of how the process started. So you're, he's saying he's throwing out 500, which is a third of what you know this house is going to be worth. And then yeah. you still decide to play hardball. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. that's some yeah. cojones, man. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment. I love, you know, getting deals. So. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, originally, we wanted to actually take this down and do a burr, right? Buy it, renovate it and then rent it out long right. term. Right. Uh, but then midway or, or even flip it as condos ourselves, but midway through, we decided to, to, to wholesale it off to another investor. Gotcha, gotcha. So how did you ultimately get under contract then, you guys? What did you land on price-wise? We ended up landing on 475. Okay, so he still came off of his price. Yeah, he, he came down some, 475, all cash. I think he gave us uh, 60 days to close. Okay. Uh, then we were off to the races and then after he signed the contract he um, went ghost he went ghost <laughs> disappeared oh, no oh, no God. actually before he signed the contract we sent him the contract oh yeah before yep. we sent him the contract and we were negotiating the terms you know as is and uh we were wanting him to get rid of the tenants or the occupants who weren't paying rent so i was like okay well you handle that and he was like no I can't handle that right? because so, I don't know who they are and I don't, I don't want to go through the Massachusetts eviction process. Which yeah. Is, so uh, he sent him a, um, it was a form from our attorney and it was for him to sign and then we would deliver it to all the squatters that was in the like property. A notice to vacate. A notice to vacate and thing. And the guy would not respond at that point. So I didn't know what was going on, but um, hmm. I'm like a, the master of emotional intelligence. So whenever my husband gets to a deal where all of a sudden something goes wrong or something goes south, that in, that he'll luck. call me in. And he was like, hey, the seller went ghost. I can't get a hold of him. Now, it's been a couple, like a month. <clears throat> and no word um, from him. He's not responding to calls, texts, or emails. So he sent me the email thread. I read through the email thread. And I literally say to him, I said, okay, this is what you're about to do. Send him this email now and type it out word for word. And I told him- She gave me the verbiage, the every, magical words to right. say. Right. Email him and said, hey, Mr. Um, whatever his name was, I said, um, hey, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and take care of the tenant problems. You don't have to worry about that. We'll get the squatters out. Um, all we need from you is sign the contract, send it back and let us know where you would like for us to send your money at because we're ready to close this in the next week. Um, Smart. If that works for you. And then I made him say at the end again, 
again, if you can just let me know, you know, send me over your banking information as well so I can make sure this stuff gets to the attorney because I want to make sure we get this money in your hand as soon as possible. He sent it over. The guy emailed him back within one like minute later. one, two minutes <laughs> and was like, wow. all set. I'm sending over the contract to you. And I told him, I said, he just did not want to deal with the eviction process here in Boston. Right. Boston is a tenant friendly state. Yep. So you can go through that process for a year. And yep. I could tell he never said it in the email. So he never said, hey, I don't want to deal with the tenants or anything like that. He just didn't respond whenever he sent those emails right. that had something to do with the tenant. I said, yeah. he, he's not going to deal with that. I said, we have to take that burden on. And that's what we did. And then we passed it on to the seller. <laughs> to the buyer. To, to the, the buyer. buyer. Yeah. The buyer. So, so, so you get this thing. So you're just like, forget it. I'll deal with these tenants. And it, yeah. I just, we know that it was a good enough price. It, even if it took you a year or somebody else a year, you're buying it low enough. It didn't matter at that point. Right. So, yeah. How quickly did you close then after that, after you finally responded? So once he responded, we were other, under contract, right? So now we're like, okay, we need to find a buyer for this. So I'd yeah. already been talking to contacts we have there. So brokers and people like yourself in Boston who, you know, flip houses, they have brokerages, they have networks of cash buyers. So of course the question is, okay, great. I love the deal. I love the area. I want it. When can I get in? What's the situation, right? And I have to tell them, you can't get in because the squad is there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, you know, and I can tell them the situation, there's only a few buyers who wanted to take on that, right? But we, we found a, the buyer that was willing to buy it as is with tenants in place and figure that out later. Yeah. And ended up closing probably like 30 days later. And we actually did a double close. Oh, you right? did? Okay. Yep. Yeah, because we definitely didn't want that. So okay. like the final, so we had under contract 475. The ARV was 1.5 million. And the yep. play on these deals, um, Ken, is it's a triplex. So what people do in Boston is they take these old 1900 Victorian triplexes, they gut them, right? And they'll, they'll turn them into three condos. So they'll spend a hundred thousand per unit in the rehab, but we were buying it. Our price was per, per, per square foot was $150 per square foot. The ARV uh, sale price per square foot was 475. <laughs> so there was so much meat on the bone there. It was crazy. That's why we wanted to take it down ourselves. But again, being a thousand miles away, we were like, okay, let's just quick flip this, wholesale it. Um, so we ended up selling it for 580. Sold it for 580. Buyer. So our gross profit was 105,000. Uh, we did a double close. So we, um, we had paid a transactional lender. I think it was like 1% or something like that. It was like 1500 bucks or a thousand bucks to, um, you know, we did the A to B close. And then an hour later, uh, we went in and sold it to the cash buyer the same day. Awesome. That's a tough one, man, to not take down yourself. When you oh see that God. kind of spread, yeah. I know you guys scratched your head thinking about that one for a while. I mean, I mean, so. We're thinking of moving back to Boston just to do it. Right. And then we, I was wow. like, uh, now let's go ahead and, and just wholesale it. I mean, you know, again, though, it's, it's like that if we're in it for 800 and we can sell it for 1.5, do we move to Boston for a year and just figure this thing out, right? I mean, that's a lot of sticking money. Right. Because that's what he wanted to do, too. He was like, right. we can move. <laughs> well, really, it was our third deal that we ever closed. Our third deal. So yeah. August of 2018, we closed our first wholesale deal. We made eleven thousand. Our second one, we closed in September. We made five thousand, and then we closed this one in October. Made a hundred and five grand. So now we're like, I mean, this is life changing money. It was like I was sure. ready to quit my job. I was like, <laughs> you know, because people don't make yeah. that in a year, two yep. years, let alone yep. one deal. So it was a life changing deal for us. Yep. That's amazing that you hit a unicorn like that right out of the gates. I mean, with a mailer that was so little, you got the, just the, the perfect seller. I mean, that situation's amazing. And then make a hundred thousand dollar rip yeah. on your third deal. It was gonna come along every day. <laughs> You're gonna convince everybody that watches this to get into real estate if they're if they're on the on the fence right now because they're like, <laughs> that is a lot of most people don't even make that in a year, and you made that in one transaction. Right. right. So let me ask you this: at that point, so yeah, buying up properties in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, cash is that what you is that so you took the money from from that and then it just okay. reinvested in the money uh, into the Absolutely. into the business yeah multi is what we were started buying in um really good areas single families as well gotcha <laughs> so how did this i'm i'm sure it changed your business and your mindset in a, in a zillion different ways but what's like the primary way that you feel like it changed your business going forward after that i think one of the ways that it definitely changed our business is um, it showed us that um, it was possible 
to do with one of the things that we're really big on is education. And we had spent so much money on education, on getting educated in Masterminds, mentors, coaches. Before we closed one deal, we probably spent upwards of 100000 just in exactly. education, learning. Wow. Absolutely. Right. Wow. So when it came down to getting into it, we really then started to see the benefits of all this education that we had been getting over the course of a year. And it really showed us like, oh, okay, shoot. This is what they were talking about in this mastermind. This is what the mentor was saying. Um, and it just helped us really um, elevate our, our business and rapidly at a rapid pace. Um, because from there, it uh, really afforded us the ability to start purchasing. And that was our main goal was to buy and hold. Yep. Um, we already had one rental property in Boston, but it definitely changed our life as far as, okay, listen, this is definitely possible um, with the systems and the right systems and tools. And we had a lot of our buddies who flip houses. They, they saw what we did on that one deal and they started wholesaling. <laughs> no doubt, man. It's funny. I, we flipped for so many years. We wholesale way more than we flip now. It's like at some point in time, you just get the grind wears on you and wholesaling is so easy and low risk. It's just like, just turn those suckers out. Less capital, less risk. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Most of your bigger players, I feel like in the bigger markets are wholesalers. Now they're not flippers because you can just right. scale so much easier. Yeah. Absolutely. Our acquisition guy on that property who um, helped us find the buyer, which the buyer ended up paying him as well on that property. Um, he was a big flipper and is now, and we contacted him about another property in Boston and he was like, and him and Dudley just got to talk and he was like, yeah, I'm not doing too much flipping now. D. am more into wholesaling. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee dealing with the city of Boston is not easy. Because Atlanta is hard. I can imagine Boston's ridiculously oh, yeah. hard. It is ridiculously hard. And yeah. It's very, very cutthroat. Very yeah. Cutthroat. Yeah. It's only to where it's just not even worth holding it for a year to work through all your permits and whatnot. It's like, oh, I'll just make a quick rip and get out of here. Yeah. Right. That's amazing. Congrats, guys. I mean, you really haven't been in the business that long, a couple of years. But to build up the portfolio that you've built and to get these kind of deals, I mean, you guys have already hit your stride early on in your real estate investing careers. I think that's phenomenal. Very cool story. Thank you. So, well, guys, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Glad to call you guys friends after this. Well, thank you awesome. for having us. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Best Deal Ever show brought to you by Bigger Pockets. If you've been energized, entertained, or enlightened by today's show, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ken Corsini or check us out online at redbarnhomes.com. And don't forget, one man's best deal ever may be the inspiration you need to create your next best deal. So hope to see you on the next episode.